Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics, and we're going to talk about aiming speakers again, <laughs> because I think that that was a popular topic. There was some pushback and, and other views, and I think that no matter how many times I talk about how I feel and how this works, um, there tends to be some misunderstanding, so I'm going to keep talking about it, but um, Taum KY, Toem KY, I'm not sure how that's pronounced, apologies if that's a known thing, gave me $25, so thank you very much, that was very generous of you. And you said, hooray, I'm the first. Great video and well explained. Very helpful, especially on the subject of aiming and placement. Lots of experts say speakers should be aimed, but don't really discuss its effectiveness or reasoning. I feel this also clarifies the snake oil of aimable tweeters. So many big and expensive brands out there that push this idea, like the JBL Synthesis SCL5, and there even be on-axis position when everything at and below 1500 hertz is pointing the opposite direction of the listener. It makes even less sense than bouncy house Atmos speakers. So actually, I think there was a misunderstanding of how the SCL5 speaker works and some of the other aimed speakers. Um, if you look at the directivity plot of a speaker, especially if you look at those ones that are like heat map style, what you'll find is that you'll get down to a certain frequency and then at that frequency and below, the speaker becomes omnidirectional. It actually radiates everywhere. And so once you put that speaker into a wall, you get perfect 180 degree dispersion with no change with angle. The point at which that happens completely depends on the size of the drivers. But when you've got something that's like a five and a quarter inch driver, 1500 hertz is definitely in the realm of where you're going omni. So what that means is it doesn't matter where you aim that speaker, you can aim it in different directions that are not pointed towards the listener and it's not gonna affect what they hear. Because if you cross over then at that point of let's say 1500 hertz, only the tweeter needs to aim to actually affect things. So aiming only the tweeter can work, one of the issues with the speakers that has the swivelable tweeters is that when you swivel it, you aren't necessarily changing things in a way that's consistent enough for the response to remain correct. But uh, it's like so what you're trying to do is move the lobes. There's like a peak in the lobe. You're trying to move where it is. And an aimable tweeter may not do that. Aiming the tweeter, though, and then optimizing the crossover for the new aimed angle can do that. So actually, that JBL CL5... I, there had been a review on Audio Science Review, Amir did it, and he, he actually said this. So like for, for those of you who didn't understand this, he was very clear that when he measured it, <laughs> the speaker had been measured in a way that assumed an orientation where on axis was the zero degree position straight down, but actually its optimized angles were a different set of angles because it was just, I forget what the optimized, like 30 degrees or something like that, but it's optimized for a particular position so it can be aimed. And it made it look really, really lousy, like exceptionally lousy. Um, it also had not been tested in the way that JBL assumes that all synthesis speakers will be used, which is part of their ecosystem with EQ of the response based on anechoic data. And so some of the peaks and dips in the response made the speaker look worse than it would ever be in real life. And even I looked at it and thought, that does not look very good. Even if you conceptualize a reorientation of it to the right angle, it still doesn't look very good. And I had a project where we were using JBL synthesis. It wasn't necessarily my choice to do it. So for those who were like, well, if it didn't look good, why'd you use it? it, it we were stuck with it because that's what the client and the integrator that we were engineering the system with had wanted. And I, um, I don't have a problem with JBL synthesis speakers. The engineering is actually pretty solid. It's not my first choice. There's other products I like better, but I know some people who think it's like awful and poorly engineered, and that's not really true. Um, the engineering behind it is actually quite solid. So I talked to the engineer who designed that speaker, and he told me the backstory. He said basically they were putting together, I think it was their own demo room, and, or it might have been a lab space, but they were putting together an Atmos system, and they put all their best speakers that they had just designed in, so they've got their, I don't know what it was for sure, but let's say it was the JBL M2s for the LCRs, and they put in their surround speakers, which were a new product coming out, and they were trying to figure out what to do in the ceiling, and there was a bunch of people pointing out that because of the relatively controlled and narrower directivity of, of typical JBL synthesis speakers, having like a coaxial design that just points down, but with a waveguide would end up putting you way far off axis and screw up the response. So they wanted to aim them. And they came up with an optimized design that actually created a, a built-in aiming, and that's what that speaker is. And they've actually made some in-wall speakers that have aim tweeters as well for the same reason, because again, for like the wides, what do you do if it's flat against the wall? You need to aim towards the listener. And so if you don't measure it correctly, it will look exceptionally bad. If you do measure it, you can actually see what it's doing and where it's good. And while it's not the best, the ProListen is a far more optimized version of that kind of a name speaker, actually. 
um, you can actually see that the, that isn't bad. So he sent me some raw data of what they got in an anechoic chamber. I think it was a hemi, a hemi chamber. I then actually took the data from um, Audio Science Review, which uh, he very kindly provides everybody to download and do what you want with, and reprocessed that data based on the reorientation and looked at it, and then they gave me the PEQ filters, the, the filtering that they do to it in the synthesis so we could see what that would look like, and I put the filters in, and all of a sudden it actually looked very decent. And I thought, okay, so if this is how it's intended, then this is actually working quite well. So let's go back to the aiming things. Like I said, aiming the tweeters is not a problem because of how the speakers work. Prolisten aims the woofer away from the listener as well, and then has the waveguide aiming it towards you, and you can see from the measurement data that it's exceptional. It works very, very well, and it provides this optimized response for the listening range. Aiming, I stand by, for the most part, doesn't affect things like envelopment or immersion. Or Somebody had mentioned dynamics. I don't see a reason why it could have any effect on dynamics. It affects the frequency response. And so if a change in the spectral balance changes your perception of dynamics, then sure, it could have an effect on that. But all of that starts with the premise that if you're sitting here and the speaker is up there in the ceiling, that the response your ear is getting is really, really bad. Well, there's a lot of speakers like Kef's where they have such a wide dispersion out to very high frequencies and the tweeter doesn't really beam a lot that sitting at this angle doesn't actually give you a particularly bad frequency response. It's actually good. It, it's, it's a proper shape and size. And moving across these seats doesn't change the angle enough to change the response that much because of the wide dispersion. What does happen is that speaker becomes louder. And so one of the advantages that I like with the more controlled dispersion approaches and the aiming, but it, not any speaker can do this. So just aiming any old speaker won't do this. It's the controlled dispersion speakers like the JBLs, the Perlisons, or even some that are even more controlled, is that you can use cross-firing techniques to make it so that as you move across the seats, the SPL levels change in a way that's more consistent. So you're getting closer to a speaker, it gets louder, but you're sitting farther off axis, and so that makes it get quieter, and the two cancel each other out, and the SPL levels are the same across each seat. So that's what the cross-firing technique is all about, and it's a really good idea. It's just that it only works if the speaker's dispersion is controlled in such a way where you're seeing constant directivity, meaning the frequency response doesn't change as you move off axis, at least over a certain range of angles, it just gets quieter. The JBLs do that, the Perlisons do that, um, the cuffs kind of do that, but not really. They're pretty wide dispersion, and I've done some measurements and everything to see how they work. They're, I mean, it's actually better than some. But like, a, no offense to this company, a Bowers & Wilkins, for instance, doesn't do that. And you can't use it that way. It's not going to give you those results. So um, I'm not against aiming, but I think that the idea gets blown out of proportion. I think that people think that aiming speakers becomes really critical to enhancing the experience, and I think misunderstand what it is they're fixing. Like I said, primarily, it's actually frequency response and then the SPL consistency across seats. Um, so, you know, in the case of that speaker that was thought of as being bad, it's actually not as bad as it seems. And in, in the case of speakers, and I'm, I should look it up, you know, I don't remember all the JBL synthesis stuff. I just assumed what he was talking about. So let me see what... On my phone on the video, sorry guys, JBL, SCL... Five. Yeah, the SCL5 was the one I was thinking about, so that's the in-ceiling one. There's a lot of speakers that have pivoting tweeters. I've actually not seen anybody measure those and then pivot the tweeter to see what it does to the lobe. I am very skeptical that that works well, but I've seen other speakers with the optimized aimed waveguides and with detailed measurement data so um, one of them is Pro Audio Technology, and another one is the Perlison stuff, and um, have gotten to understand how the aiming has worked and optimized in those well enough to see that that works really well. Um, I also have a friend that does, his name is Renee, and he does console modeling. So Renee, if you watch this, sorry, I'm calling you out. Uh, he's very good at what he does, very smart guy. Um, and he has done a lot of modeling of the way speaker uh, integration directivity works, and he and I have talked about the idea of using ComSol modeling to, uh, to do that kind of work. And he's also pointed out that that's a very effective solution when done correctly. So aiming a tweeter and not the woofers is okay. It just depends on how it's done and whether the whole system as a whole has been accounted for properly. But <laughs> as I said, is aiming desirable? Yes, but it depends on the speaker's directivity and dispersion pattern. 
And what it's fixing is primarily, as I said, the spectral balance and, uh, and then SPL evenness. It's not making it more immersive. It shouldn't be making it more dynamic. I just like dynamics is the difference between the lowest sounds you hear and the loudest sounds you hear. Lowest being lowest in level, quietest and loudest. So why would a aiming of a speaker change that? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and you got to remember too, how much off axis we are from the speakers. Like it just isn't enough of a change to matter. So the only reason why that change could cause that would be if your perception of the dynamics is being affected by the shift in the spectral balance. And if the speaker's spectral balance shifts a lot as you change the angle. Um, I, the other thing I'll just reiterate, cause I think this comes up a lot. Remember that if you did something and it didn't work and then you upgraded to a completely different speaker that did two things, let's say one was it allow you to aim the speaker and the other was it was just a better quality speaker and you heard a huge improvement, you can't say it's because you aim the speaker. It could very well be that it's a better speaker. Too many variables change to attest that it's one versus the other. And um, so it's really critical to understand that when you're making upgrades, many things sometimes come into play. I actually just made an upgrade in my own theater. Uh, so the upgrade was that all of my so my front left right speakers were purify powered. The center was not, and the surrounds were not. They were using a class A B amp. Not a particularly good one, nowhere near as quiet. It was, and I say not a particularly good one, compared to like state of the art purify amps, this was like an, AT, an older ATI amp, and it was um, being sold by, uh, or not, no, it's not ATI. I'm sorry, it's a Chinese company that makes it, and it was sold by uh, Outlaw Audio. It's a very, very good value. It's a great amp for the money. But again, like its performance is just not to the level of the best on the market. And I had this Lingdorf amplifier, which I need to do a video review on because I'm telling you guys, this is at this point my favorite amplifier on the market for home theater use. It's an eight channel Purify amp. So it's got eight of those same modules with a dedicated power supply, fully optimized, very, very well put together package. And the end result is something that is close to state-of-the-art performance. It's extremely quiet, low noise, very low distortion, very linear, no change in the frequency response with the, with the speaker load. And so I upgraded, and all of a sudden, everything got, like, to me, a bit better. Well, here's the problem. The gain on that amplifier is way lower because it's adjustable. So the noise floor dropped, not just because the amplifier is quieter, but also because I knocked down over 12 dB of gain. So that was a pretty significant change. The other thing was the amplifier produces something like twice the power. <laughs> like, so if you compare the two, like I've now doubled the power that each one of my, I think before my speakers were getting like 175 watts. Now they're getting 400 watts. Um, so there's a significant, like I've gained at least 3 dB of headroom. Now, was I clipping the old amp? I don't think so. But there's been so many upgrades that have been made to the system in the process of changing that amp out that the fact that I heard a difference is like, well, yeah, it, it, but it like, is it because it's Purify versus this cheaper amplifier module? That's maybe a piece of it, but there's many things that improved as a result of that. I mean, we even changed the wires out, if you guys want to make an argument about that, and we re-ran them in a way that was cleaner and reduced the chance of picking up noise. Do I think there was a problem before or a quality issue with the wires? No, but since we had to change everything, um, I needed to get wires that were a better size. We had them coiled up before because <laughs> they were way too long. So now I got sizes that were shorter that allowed us to run everything in a cleaner way and didn't have a coil in the back. All of those are big improvements that help. And so the fact that the system sounded better is not a shock, but I'm not going to tell you it's just because it's Purify. There's other reasons for it. Uh, or just Lingdorf, really. I think the average person wouldn't look at it as the module in it, but who makes the amp, which is Lingdorf. Um, but when I get into that amp, you guys should check it out. I forget the model number. I should know that, but it's an eight channel model with Purify. It just came out in the last year. Um, I think it's a very, very good amplifier. I'm not going to call it a value. I don't even know the price on it. So I need to find that out before they, I do the review, but you know, you, you don't have to look at everything as whether it's a good value or not. You can look at it in terms of absolute performance too. And I think that for what it is, it's absolute performance is very, very good. It's a compact package with eight channels. It's extremely clean. Very, very high signal to noise ratio. When I did my testing on it, I had to use my cleanest version of my test setup, which includes a notch filter. And um, I had to use a very high end, uh, very, very clean DAC because the built in tone generator on my analyzer was not clean enough. Um, the other thing I was using was a oscillator, which is the cleanest way of producing a tone. So it's a one kilohertz oscillator with a one kilohertz notch filter. And the amplifier, when I tested the original Purify amplifier, it was right at the limits of what that could do. 
And I was kind of curious if when you stick eight of them in a box with this power supply, is it going to stay just as clean? And the answer is yes. I once again hit the limits of my analyzer testing this thing. So that's pretty cool. I mean, I haven't seen that in a lot of other uh, implementations that have used eight modules like that. Um, and it seemed it was totally happy to run. I didn't do eight, but I did seven channels at once. It seemed totally happy to do that without issue. It didn't shut down. It doesn't produce as much power as just running one channel, but it wasn't reduced by all that much either. I'd have to go look at the test data again, but I think it was like if I got, I don't know, let's just say 410 watts with one channel at four ohms, I was getting like 375 watts or something like that with seven of them going. So it was pretty impressive. Anyway, so thanks for watching the video. Uh, and uh, I hope this is helpful. Like I said, we can keep talking about the aiming thing, but I think that there's some confusion still around that and as well as my views. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Subscribe to my videos. That helps to make sure you can stay on top of all the new content. These donations are really appreciated. I really uh, find that helpful. And, and so continue to make those and you'll help to support what I'm doing. Thanks again, everybody.